It's really kind of hard to say exactly when I started listening to jazz. I can say I started listening to it seriously uh, right around when I was maybe 19 or 20, um, um, around that time. But, uh, but jazz had kind of been around. I, uh, first off, since I'm from New Orleans and you know just going to the city to grab a beignet, uh, you're going to be exposed to some second line music or you're going to be exposed to uh, um, you know, some traditional uh, jazz. And you know, we may, may have seen Pete Fountain on, the, on TV. I used to love to see Pete Fountain. And then um, Dizzy Gillespie would be on TV from time to time. I remember we used to call him Apple Cheeks because it looked like he'd shove these big apples in his cheeks. <laughs> I pretty much always wanted to be a musician. I, uh, there was never a time in my life that I didn't aspire to be a musician. There was a time period where I didn't think it was possible. And, and during that time period, I tried a bunch of different things. I tried uh, I, you know, switching around my major, psychology and, and uh, computer science. That was a funny one. But, uh, um, but, and then I tried music education for a minute. And then it just, I, just, I was just never happy with any of that. And I just, I knew that I wanted to be a, a professional musician and, um, and pursued the classical clarinet. Really, I started playing the clarinet um, somewhere between third and fourth grade, the summer between third and fourth grade. That's when my mother surprised me and brought home the, the clarinet that changed my life. And my sister, uh, uh, who was a flautist, she showed me all my first fingerings and. And um, so she was, in a lot of ways, my first clarinet teacher before I started studying with this uh, guy named uh, Joseph Lewis, of all names. <laughs> I know that when I was in high school, my brother, who was a trumpeter, he started getting into Maynard Ferguson. And so, um, so we used to listen to recordings of uh, Maynard playing Gonna Fly Now, you know, the, the disco period of Maynard Ferguson. But that, that was about the depths of it. But uh, the thing that really changed things my mother switched from opera to jazz. She had, uh, you know, various bands, and every now and then she would have them rehearse at the house. But I always looked at that. That's kind of my mom's thing, and um, you know, she she's doing her thing. Back then, I wasn't the Rush and Led Zeppelin and things like that, and and Prince and Earth, Wind and Fire, and so I I wasn't really wanting to check that out so much. So the thing that really changed it for me is. I got drafted to play the saxophone um, in middle school once, and from that point on, I was kind of, uh, uh, every now and then I would join the, the jazz ensemble in middle school, high school, and, uh, and so when I went to college, I thought it would be the same thing. I joined the stage band and, and at Carroll College, where I was at at the time, and the band director, uh, uh, Robert Halseth, he, one day he came up to me and said, hey, I've got a gig for you um, playing for this polka band uh, marching around County Stadium in Milwaukee for uh, tailgate parties. And so I'm like, okay, I've never done a gig before, so yeah, why not? So I went and I played um, the little chicken dance and all that stuff with a polka band. I thought it was kind of fun, you know, got uh, got to see the Milwaukee Brewers games for, for free. But then after that, I got recommended for a jazz fusion band, and it was uh, a band called Le Crew. And that band started to actually get kind of popular around the Milwaukee area. And so I thought, well, if I'm gonna be playing in front of all these people, I better practice. And so I started practicing the saxophone, and, and uh, I got better. And then my brother, he kept on saying like, well, you're listening to all these fusion people. You need to listen to some jazz. Yeah, you need to check. At that point, he had started studying uh, jazz trumpet with uh, David Hazeltine. And, um, and so he was like, you need to check out some jazz. And, and I'm like, well, whatever, whatever. But then he turned me on the John Coltrane. He finally got me to settle down long enough to play uh, Monk's Mood and Trinkle Tinkle for me. And I was just like, whoa, wow. And I knew from that moment, I, was, I don't know what these guys are doing, but I want to do that. Uh, I don't understand this, I don't understand this music, but there's something about it, particularly Monk's mood, that just hits something inside of me. I can't even describe it, it was just, I, I felt like I was home. Like, like there's something like, the, almost like I just saw this distant land and I wanted to be there. So that's how that started. So then from that point on, I was in jazz like 24 seven. <laughs> Ha <laughs> ha
I've, I've always had a pretty open mind about music. I remember when I was in, um, in middle school and, and high school, and I used to wonder how come everyone listened to just one kind of music. They were like into like what's now classic rock, or they were just into Rick James or something like that. And I'm just kind of like, well, why can't we listen to all of it? I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's good music, it's good music. And so I used to, I used to listen to a lot of different things and I, and, and, and I used to enjoy it. And, I, and it's continued to this day. I like to, I like to play with a lot of musicians coming from a lot of different directions because I, I, I feel like it, um, I can go different places musically with different people. Like, you know, like, you know, if I'm playing with, if I'm playing with Bill Frizzell or back when Andrew Hill was alive, when I played with him, or when I'm playing with Russell Gunn, or when I'm playing with uh, uh, the Knoxville Jazz Orchestra, or when I'm playing with uh, uh, Omer Avatar, or all these different, they're, they're all coming from different places, and I don't play exactly the same way with all of them because they're feeding me different information. And, uh, but I, I love playing with all of them, and it's, it's really a matter of like, um, just having a, a musical dialogue with them um, based on what they're giving me, and then I can, and we can have an exchange. So uh, that's why when people hear me playing in different uh, settings, uh, I might sound slightly different. My approach to composition, it really varies depending on where the initial catalyst for my idea comes from. Sometimes it's a, sometimes it's a, I'll be tinkering around on the piano and I'll, and I'll, I'll just hear like a certain chord progression. And, um, and so, um, or sometimes it starts with a melody. Sometimes I'll hear a drum rhythm. Uh, maybe I'll be looking at some things on YouTube or, or listening to a CD and I hear a drummer do something and I'm like, well, that would make a good uh, rhythmic motif. Um, sometimes I come up with a bass line. And then whatever that uh, initial idea, whatever it is, I'll usually, uh, I used to write everything down and since I, uh, now that I have a, an iPhone, I'll record ideas into my phone and try to leave instructions and I'll come back to it later. And then I'll use the, whatever uh, uh, academic knowledge I do have to try to make it into something. Uh, I'm really good at coming, coming up with some really corny, uh, easy songs. And um, what I usually do is I'll start with something like that and then after that, then I'll start throwing stuff in and get carried away and then it'll turn into the stuff that people hear. What are some things I learned from my various musical associations? Uh, I mean, that's, that's, a, yeah, that's a real vast subject. I mean, um, I learned a lot from my tenure with Elvin Jones. Um, I'd say that, that that particular relationship made a big impact on me. I mean, I'm, I'm sorry, we, we never documented anything together, but I was in his band for two and a half years. And um, I learned a lot about really being able to bring my emotion out in the music and, uh, and, and to have, uh, I learned a lot about groove in his, in his band. I learned about like uh, uh, pacing, because we would do, uh, we'd always play these really long solos and, and, uh, and, and Elvin, I mean, he just had so much energy and he'd always be pushing us and, and we had to ride on top of that energy. And so, um, so to be able to play solos that long with that much intensity, we had to really, really learn how to improvise in the moment and not just play a whole bunch of licks and scales and patterns and stuff that we worked out. We really had to play music. And that's one of the big things I learned from uh, playing with Elvin. I played with, uh, in Tom Harrow's band for about maybe a year and a half, two years. The biggest thing I, I got from my time with Tom Harrow was composition. He was, uh, uh, he made a really, really big impact on me uh, co compositionally because he's just such a great writer and I would look at all of his charts and, and uh, just make mental notes and, and like, wow, you can play a two five, but have the five first and then the two. I've never heard anyone do that before and things like that. A lot of the, my influence from my time with Tom turned into my CD, The Hidden Light. I'd say like my, my time with Andrew Hill and my time with Dave Douglas uh, that uh, really opened me up a lot uh, as far as uh, brought a certain freedom into my playing that wasn't there before. I, I learned a lot about uh, Latin music from my time playing with Elio Villafranca and uh, some of Brian Lynch's various projects. 
I learn something from every situation I get in. And so it's, it's really, uh, we could be talking all day about this. It's, uh, uh, but that's, that's just a little snapshot of, uh, of uh, some of my influence, uh, some of what I pull from some of these associations. But there's a lot of stuff I pull from uh, my associations with people that uh, most listeners have never heard of before. How did I start following Christ? That's, uh, that's complicated and it's very hard to answer um, in a quick way. I would say that the quick answer is, I was brought up in a home where we believed in God, we, be we believed in Jesus. Um, um, I felt that when I, when I went to college, I walked away. Um, I walked away from, uh, my, back then it was a, a Catholic background. I walked away and I was really just trying to live in the world and, and lived a very crazy lifestyle for a moment, uh, which when you live that way, when you live in sin, ultimately eventually it's going to bring you down and, and, and a whole bunch of events brought me to rock bottom. At that certain point, or shortly before that, someone had given me a Bible and it was the first time I'd actually read the Bible. Um, I was uh, I was down to the point of not even want to live, and so it got me thinking about what comes after you die. Because uh, if I were to leave this planet, I'd like to know what's going to happen to me. So then I started reading the Bible, and it was like all the words were jumping off the page, and it just uh, like man, I've been uh, a so-called Christian all my life, and I never knew this and this and this and. And, um, and so that marinated for years, and I was trying to think about a way to, uh, um, I, I was kind of turned off by what I saw as more the exclusivity of, 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 uh, of, uh, of Christianity. Uh, but eventually, I'd say about three years later, after I met my wife and, uh, and we were married, the scenario that brought us together finally uh, brought us to a point where we sought God out together. And, um, and I, I want them giving my life to Jesus in 1996, and, uh, and it's been uh, it's been quite a, a journey of healing and growth ever since then. So that's a thumbnail sketch of a very very long and complicated story. Ultimately, I believe that anyone who's got any kind of gifting, um, be it like. Uh, music or a mathematician or they have uh, or acting or a plumber whatever it is um, I think that they're supposed to use that gift to bring glory back to God essentially it's it's almost like when you see the stars shine in the sky you know that those stars are not shining for themselves they, they, they shine to bring glory back to God and that's what I that's what I want my music to do that's what that's always been my goal pretty much since I gave my life to Jesus Christ is that uh, I'd like my music to be um, something that, that, uh, that makes people think about our great creator. And that's, uh, um, that's, you know, that's where this is coming from as well. I think that a lot of, um, a lot of churches get a thing where it's gotta be either Hill songs or some kind of contemporary gospel, and and I don't know if uh, I don't know if they've always really wanted to explore bringing it. I mean, there's some churches I'll think about classical music, but jazz, I don't really see that as much, and um, and I think it's just because a lot of people just aren't familiar with it. I think a, a lot of the reasons also um, why there are. Um, why jazz really isn't used in church settings as much is because a lot of, when you look at a lot of the early uh, classical musics were actually written for, for uh, church, uh, written uh, for the great churches of the past, um, funded by churches um, uh, sometimes. And then when you really look at like gospel music was birthed in the, in the church. Um, and so it's, it's very fitting that as gospel music has developed, um, it has found a great home and breeding spot in the church. And so that's a lot of what people are used to. They're used to classical music or the hymns, or they're used to the uh, contemporary gospel music. And then, and then um, 
since the 70s, uh, Christian rock, which has led into uh, things such as hill songs today. Uh, but jazz, uh, jazz is not a music that's, that was really birthed uh, in the church, although a lot of people that came out of the church uh, developed the music that we currently know as jazz. And so subsequently, there are, uh, today there are a lot of musicians that are followers of Jesus that, that play jazz music and they, uh, they may or may not be so outspoken about it, um, but people in the church in general don't know about these musicians. There are a lot of uh, musicians that will call themselves followers of, of, of Jesus in the jazz community uh, who are using their gift to try to bring glory to God uh, through their music. Um, but I think that a lot of the people in the church don't know about them and, uh, and so thus we don't really hear that music in the church. And then also I think a lot of people just haven't really thought about jazz as being a, a, a vehicle for church music. Uh, I personally think it's a great vehicle for, for uh, music in the church, just as a lot of people couldn't see how rap music could be used in the church. And then we have groups like, like uh, the Cross Movement and Tripoli and, and people like that. So it's, uh, so yes, it can be used for, for the church. What inspired me to write the, the piece? At uh, my present church, we have these small groups, and, um, and our small group, they did a study on the Pilgrim's Progress. And I had heard of uh, the Pilgrim's Progress, but I never read it before, and never didn't even know what it was about. And so it was, uh, it was really fascinating to me. And, uh, and it, it really, uh, my whole family really got into it deep, and we did a lot of study on our own with it. So the suite is based on the book, The Pilgrim's Progress, of course. And um, the book itself is actually in, uh, it's in two, uh, there's two parts to The Pilgrim's Progress. There's the first part um, that, that, uh, that traces this character's uh, journey from the city of destruction to the celestial city. And then the next part talks about, um, because he left his wife and his family in order to do this, and the second part is his, his wife and his, uh, his, his kids uh, trying to follow him there, uh, trying, to, um, trying, to, trying to go on the same journey that he was on. My suite is primarily concerned with the first part, and that's, uh, once again, it's about uh, basically the man. He reads his book, and from the book, he concludes that the city that he lived, which was called the City of Destruction, was going to be destroyed because of all the bad things that were being done in the city. Um, and so basically, he's, he learns about the Celestial City and gets directions to go to the Celestial City. And the story of the Pilgrim's Progress, the first part, is, is essentially about the adventures and hardships and trials and interesting characters and fearsome creatures that he meets along the way. Um, this story is allegorical. Uh, it's more of an, alleg an allegory. And so every place and character represents some kind of spiritual lesson. He actually wrote this book while he was in prison. He was, uh, he was uh, uh, an unlicensed preacher and back in England in those days, that was a no-no. So. Uh, and so basically he was in prison for preaching without a license, which was really bad because he had a family to support. And um, so it was uh, very hard. And if he would have just gotten that license, he would have been able to get out of prison, but he refused to do it. Um, so he, the, the book was published in 1678. And since then it's been translated into over 200 languages and has never been out of print. At a certain point, uh, because I'm always, uh, you know, being a follow, follower of Jesus, I, I always look for ways to connect my two worlds between uh, jazz and, and the gospel. And, and I just thought like, man, this is like a really great way to mesh my two worlds together. And, and, and I also thought that there's just so, so much great thematic material in this that can be used. Uh, um, I could, could I always look at how can I uh, bring out the full spectrum 
of emotion in my music. Um, you know, you got love, hate, um, you know, peace, anger, sorrow, loneliness, blah, 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 all these different emotions, and they all can bring out um, different colors in the music. And, and, uh, and I thought, there's just so much here. And so that's when I first started thinking about it. And I thought that the fact that it, it uh, that historically, uh, literature-wise, it's uh, such a celebrated uh, piece. I thought that people would uh, thought people would get a kick out of it. And so, and so I started plotting in my head. Uh, my wife and I started plotting in our heads how we would pull that off. And uh, it kind of marinated for a couple of years. And then the pandemic happened, and everything got shut down. And and uh, and I thought, well, I don't have any gigs, so I have a good chunk of time that I can, uh, if my chops go down, uh, then it won't really matter because I don't have any gigs, so I'm going to write. And so, so I spent countless hours at my computer uh, just writing stuff and just seeing what came out. And, uh, and uh, so that's where it all started. How long did it take me to write this music? I would say the the main, the, the biggest part of the suite, I would say roughly about two years. Um, I, you know, it, the, I, I got deep into it uh, during the, uh, the shutdown uh, part of the pandemic, and, uh, and I was going strong, and then all of a sudden I, uh, I had a deadline and I had to like, get it done really, really quick uh, at that point. But uh, I'd say that uh, the biggest mass of the music was written during that time. There was one piece that had been written uh, some years before, and I adapted it for this. Um, but outside of that, it's, it's roughly over that two-year period. There are uh, nine pieces in the, in the overall suite. I had originally wanted there to be about maybe 12, and um, but uh, you know, I ran short of time, and so I had to I had to stop at, at nine. Ultimately, as I uh, do this in the future, I may add a couple more uh, movements to it. Uh, there are just so many topics that can be covered in, in, the, in the book, the, the Pilgrim's Progress. Um, there's so many different characters and uh, so many different places and so many uh, different uh, adventures that the main character was on. And, and it's, um, so I could actually probably do multiple uh, say if I were looking at this like a CD, I could probably do like two or three CDs worth of music uh, in order to capture, uh, to, to be able to adequately capture everything that's in the book. But, um, but right now it stands at nine. How did I write these particular songs? Well, it's... Uh, once again, it's, uh, th there were different catalysts that, that, uh, that started each of these. For instance, City of Destruction, the, the opening, um, the chords at the very opening uh, came directly from something I heard Mulker Miller do. Um, and, uh, and then from there on, the, the solo section in that, I believe, was inspired by something I heard Michael Brecker do. There are a lot of things that I, I, I'm, I'm a real big fan of the symphonic suites of West Side Story. And so a lot of uh, ideas will come from that, um, that throughout all of these. Some of the harmonic ideas that I've got from checking out Maria Schneider showed up in uh, Slough of Despond and in Dark River. Definitely some gospel hip hop influence on uh, doubting and rewriting. There is a movement called the Valley of the Shadow of Death, and that was actually something at, uh, that was one piece in this that I didn't write right now. It was actually something I wrote years ago, uh, maybe around uh, 2015 um, for a, a CD. It didn't make the CD. And um, I basically took that. I felt that it had a place in this. And so I took it, I revised it, added some things to it, and now it's Valley of Shadow Death. That started uh, from me hearing some bata drum uh, rhythms. Specifically, some things I heard uh, drummer Kino Boto do, and um, and so I basically used that and developed it into that. Then there's classical influences throughout. Um, there's uh, the a lot of the Cuban um, jazz influences can be found in in uh, the Vanity Fair, uh, as well as influences from Wynton Marsalis there. 
so I, 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 I'd say as far as how did I write these songs, it's, uh, it really depends on uh, these pieces. It depends on which one it is. Because like when I try to play, like... So what's different about uh, my tribute to the Pilgrim's Progress uh, as opposed to what I've seen in the past, I think that uh, the, the two most obvious things to me is that I've never seen a jazz rendition of this before. I've never seen a version of uh, like a musical or, or, um, or dramatic rendition of this that, that uh, by a person of color, uh, a, a, a black person before. That doesn't mean it do that those don't exist. I just never heard of them. I mean, it'd be kind of cool if I could say I was the first to, to, to do that, but I'm not going to say I am because I just haven't checked out every single thing that's been done for this great book. So. In general, I've always got some music going on in my head. It's, it's, it used to get me in trouble when I was in school. Um, because uh, I'd be in class, and instead of listening to the teacher, I'd have this music going through my head. I'd be thinking about like, you know, like Rush, the Spirit of Radio, or something like that, uh, or whatever. And um, and I wouldn't try to daydream; it would just happen. I would be there uh, following the lecture, and the next thing you know, I'm carried off into the music. And then by the time I pull myself out of it, a couple minutes have gone by, and I'm like, oh wow, you know, uh, where are they? And, that's just something that's continued with me. Um, I'm constantly practicing in my head. Um, I'm constantly hearing scales and, and arpeggios and musical phrases. And, and sometimes I'll get song ideas. Uh, um, and it's just something that's just ongoing. I know that a lot of people look at me as being a little spaced out, but that's uh, when I'm in space, that's usually where I'm at. <laughs> you know, listening to Brahms or something when I should be listening to the conversation that's going on around me. So that's... Uh, you know, that's just who I have always been. I, I tend to work best when I have projects ahead of me. Um, I'll go for periods where I won't write anything, but then I'll get a record date, and all of a sudden I'll get this, uh, I'll get this surge of energy and focus, and then I'll, I'll dive in and I can crank out a lot of music really, really quick. That's always been the way that I've operated. But I can, I can get, uh, I can get creatively motivated just by hearing people doing great things. I mean, like, uh, I get on a project that I really, really enjoy, um, and uh, it'll get me inspired, make me want to write something. You know, like, uh, if I do something with the Todd Marcus Orchestra or with Elio Villafranca or with Bill Frizzell or uh, one of those cats, uh, just being around that creative energy uh, um, just gets me psyched, and the next thing you know, I'm, I'm writing something. And Or sometimes I'll go and see a movie and the music in the movie will be so good that it'll make me wanna, it'll give me an idea and make me wanna write something. And over at the University of Tennessee, uh, Knoxville, where I, where I teach, sometimes I'll be teaching a class and I'll demonstrate something and then all of a sudden I'll be like, wow, that's actually kinda nice. And then I'll just, uh, if it's on the board, then I'll like take a, take a little snapshot of it and I'll go home and try to work it out later. And, and that, that kind of stuff has turned up in many of my songs. So, so that's, uh, those are some of the ways I stay creative and motivated. So. How would I describe my style, my playing style in one word? Hopefully passionate, because uh, that's always been a goal of mine is to be felt in my music. I had, a, there was a drummer named uh, 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 Sonny Hamp who lived in, uh, in St. Louis and he, uh, he once told me, it's better to be felt than to be heard. And that's, that was uh, the best musical advice that had ever been given by anybody. And it's been pretty much where I've been coming from, uh, from the beginning, because we can have a whole lot of uh, knowledge of music. We can know a lot of stuff, but if, if our listener isn't feeling what we're playing, then we're not really saying anything. And when you look at the history of, of, of the music, uh, Louis Armstrong and Sarah Vaughn and, and Ben Webster and, and even like John Coltrane and Miles Davis. They were all musicians that had a lot of theoretical knowledge, but they, but they, but they, you felt something right in here when, when, when they would play. And, and for me, if I, if, if, if I'm playing something and someone's not feeling it, then I'm not doing my job. That's, that's, uh, you know, so hopefully passionate will be how people could describe my music. <laughs>